In the late 1800s, there was a Frenchman that was sitting at his desk looking out the window at all of the different land. He noticed something that gave him an idea. This idea led to what is now known as the Pareto Principle. And this principle has the power to change your investment and financial life forever. This video is for educational purposes only. It should not be considered investment, legal, or tax advice. It is not an offer to buy or sell any security. Past performance does not indicate future results. Investing is risky. If you've already signed up for my evaluation course, I did just post two new modules. Uh, one is on the Peter Lynch peg ratio, and then the other is on Ben Graham's valuation formula for growth stocks. So if you haven't checked those out, be sure to log in to your course uh, and you can download those videos. If you're not signed up, you can get a coupon link in the description down below. With that out of the way, let's get back to the video. Vilfredo Pareto noticed that about 80% of the land in his home country was owned by just 20% of the residents. Meanwhile, 80% of the population only owned about 20% of the land. He expanded his study to include other countries, and what he found was a very similar distribution. 80% of the land was owned by just 20% of the people. He wrote his theory into the book, Cours de Economie Politica, and I definitely did not pronounce that right. But those principles largely went unnoticed until the 1940s. Joseph Duran was a management consultant who stumbled upon Pareto's work, and he wondered if he could apply it to business. He found that about 20% of the process was responsible for 80% of the quality control issues in any particular product. So if he could just fix the 20% of the process that was broken, 80% of the problems would go away. The Pareto Principle, or 80-20 rule as it's come to be known, has worked in many different contexts. For example, 20% of the world's citizens own right around 80% of the world's total wealth. 20% of the citizens pay about 87% of the taxes. Microsoft found that eliminating 20% of the most reported bugs would eliminate about 80% of the operating system crashes. 15% of baseball players account for 85% of the wins. 20% of patients consume about 80% of healthcare resources and expenses. The Dunedin study found that 20% of the population commits 80% of the crime. And even COVID-19, 80% of the infections were traced back to just 20% of the population. The Pareto Principle is everywhere. And investing is no different. Today, we're going to look at nine different investment principles that the Pareto Principle can teach us. The first lesson the Pareto Principle applies in the investing world is that 20% of the stocks will generate 80% of the long-term results. Meanwhile, the other 80% of stocks will generate about 20% of the results. A study called the Capitalism Distribution by Eric Crittenden and Cole Wilcox from 2006 studied all the stocks in the Russell 3000, including the ones that were eventually bought or went out of business. So in total, it was about 8,000 different stocks. They studied those from 1983 to 2006. And what they found was about 39% of those stocks were completely unprofitable. 18.5% of the stocks basically went bankrupt or at least lost most of their value, at least 75%. These two segments were also a part of a broader group, 64%, that ended up underperforming the Russell 3000. But the study found that 25%, or roughly 2,000 of these 8,000 stocks, were responsible for 100%, not just 80, but 100% of these stock markets gain. And within that 25%, they found that 6.1%, or 494 of the stocks, outperformed the Russell 3000 index overall by 500% or more. The other 1,500 roughly of the 2,000 big performers went up by 300% or more. So if you have a portfolio of 100 stocks, chances are that about 20% or 20 of those stocks are going to be responsible for 100% of your long-term performance. The others are either going to be average or head towards zero. 
And that is the basis of the coffee can portfolio idea uh, that I've been very interested in and made several videos on and have now started my own portfolio of. I'll put a link in the description below if you're interested in more about that particular strategy. The second investment lesson from the Pareto principle is that 20% of the returns come from which stocks you own, while 80% of your returns are going to be from owning stocks, period. So if you have a portfolio or a savings account or something that's invested in 100% cash, that's going to earn you uh, about 0% per year in interest. Whereas if you would just take this cash and invest it into stocks, uh, you could say your long-term returns are likely to be, we'll say 7% just to be conservative uh, or potentially and likely more than that. But this difference between basically zero and seven is incredibly high. So just owning a broad-based stock index is going to be a major, major improvement in your future returns. Meanwhile, taking this 7% if you're already invested in stocks and increasing that by picking better than average individual stocks may improve your returns, but not nearly as much uh, as just going from cash to stocks. Even the best stock pickers from mutual funds and hedge funds and that sort of thing are at best only going to be able to add about one and a half to two and a half percent per year in investment returns. Of course, you have outliers like Warren Buffett that have earned you know even better than that, but uh, for the the average person like you and me, we would do pretty well to just get an extra uh, percent or two on our portfolio. So just getting invested in stocks at all uh, is going to be a much bigger deal than you know taking this additional step to investing in the best individual stocks. The third lesson is that 80% of your results is going to come from how much you are saving or your savings rate. Only 20% of your results are going to come from improving your investment return. Several studies have found that contrary to uh, popular belief, uh, opinion, most mutual funds actually do have stock picking skill. The average fund was able to pick stocks that outperformed their benchmark by 0.7% per year. Of course, the problem and the reason these funds underperform is that most of them are going to charge fees that are greater than 0.7%. So if you subtract the average 1% fee, uh, you net out to a negative 0.3% underperformance each year. So it's not necessarily that they can't pick stocks, it's just that they can't pick stocks well enough in a lot of cases to offset the fee that they're charging. However, the point is that this 0.7% per year improvement over their benchmark uh, is the result of a ton of different work from a lot of talented people with a ton of data, all these very smart uh, mutual fund managers, if they can only manage a 0.7% increased return on average, then it makes sense that the average person, like you and me, is going to have a difficult time doing even better than they can do. But let's say that you happen to be an absolute genius and you're able to beat the market by 1.2% per year. And that would be enough to make you an investment legend. But let's just say you can, you can do that. And let's say you can do it all in about 10 hours uh, per week. So you do 10 hours per week of research and that increases your return above the benchmark. So let's say the benchmark returns 8% and you're able to get 9.2% per year on your investments. And let's say you're able to invest, uh, let's say $1,000 per month, and you do this for 30 years. If you had just invested the money in an index fund, your result in 30 years would be 1,359,399. Meanwhile, your actual returns, since you're an investing genius, grew the portfolio to 1,697,000. 971. So the difference between these two portfolios is what you basically earned with your 10 hour per week investment of time. So the question is, what would happen? What would you need to save extra in order to make up for the difference? So let's say instead of investing 10 hours per week in your investment portfolio, if you would simply try to increase your skills, maybe get a side job, 
a side hustle of some kind, and you would be able to earn just a little bit of extra money per month and invest that in the portfolio, you would only need to save an additional $250 per month in order to earn the exact same ending portfolio. So the point being that the majority of your future investment returns are going to be from how much you save, not necessarily by working hard to increase your returns. Obviously, that's better than having lower returns, but uh, it would be much easier for you just to make more money, save more money, and accept a lower return than it would be to fight tooth and nail to increase your returns by uh, you know, a couple percent per year. The fourth principle is that 80% of your returns are going to be driven by your asset allocation as a whole, meaning how much you have in cash, how much you have in bonds, and how much you have in stocks. 20% is going to be driven by your intra-asset allocation, meaning within the stock portion, how much do you have in REITs, how much do you have in you know the tech sector, how much do you have in uh, you know growth or dividends or whatever. So focus a lot more attention on maintaining an optimal amount of cash, bonds, and stocks that's appropriate for your particular goals, your timeline, that sort of thing, and focus less attention on which type of sectors or allocations or whatever within each of those segments. The fifth principle is that roughly 80% of stock market years are losses, like 2022, for example. Uh, And this is where the majority, I'd say 80% of the attention goes on these 20% of bad years. Meanwhile, 80% of the stock market years end up being gains. So if you're someone that has a 10, 20, 30 year time period, don't focus at all on short term investment losses. Whatever happens over the next six to 12 months is ultimately meaningless to your future investment returns. What matters far more is that you're able to continually invest in stocks year after year after year. So stay focused on that. Focus on not the 20% of investment losses, but the 80% of years where it's likely that you're going to see investment gains. The sixth principle is that 20% of your investment success is going to be finding the perfect strategy. 80% of your success is going to be finding the perfect strategy for you. The strategy that works for me may not be the strategy that works for you. Whatever works for you may not work for your neighbor. So stop trying to chase after the absolute perfect investment strategy. First of all, it doesn't exist. But even if it did, it's going to take you your whole life. You'll never find it, right? You'll never know right now what is the perfect investment strategy for the next 30 years. We have no idea. So I think the best thing you can do is find something that works for you. And that depends on a lot of factors, one being how well do you understand it. So if you understand real estate really well, then you invest in real estate. If you understand dividend stocks and you like dividend stocks really well, then by all means, invest in dividend stocks. If you're someone that goes after growth stocks and you like trying to find the next hottest stock, then by all means, you go after that strategy. I think where people get in trouble is they look around at everyone else and say, oh, that's a better strategy. That person's earning more higher returns than I am. So I'm going to switch to invest and do what they do. The problem is that doing what they do may not really resonate well with you. Maybe you don't understand what they're doing or understand why that particular strategy works well. So whenever you get into a bad market, you're not gonna know what to do. You're gonna panic and sell. So find something that you like, that you understand, and that you think is going to get you from point A to point B, whatever that is for you, and then just stick with that strategy. The seventh principle is that 20% of your knowledge is going to come from 80% of whatever you read or watch. Basically, this is entertainment. And 80% of your knowledge is going to come from about 20% of what you watch, what you read. I'm constantly amazed by people that they ask for recommendations on what they should read, and they never seem to have time to read Warren Buffett's letters to shareholders. They never have enough time to read Howard Marks's memos. But yet these same people take an hour every single weekday to watch Jim Cramer on CNBC. Go study the track record of Jim Cramer 
and tell me why anyone should listen to what he has to say. Go find these successful investors out there and study them, learn from them. Don't get on YouTube and look at all the hype and find people that are recommending these ridiculous, you know, high flying stocks. These people have no idea what they're talking about. Learn from the 20%, the high quality, the good information. That's where you're going to get 80% of your knowledge. The eighth principle is extremely important. 20% of your future returns are going to depend on when you buy. 80% are going to depend on how long you hold. I get questions from people all the time. They're wondering, is now a good time to buy stocks, right? So the market's been heading down. So everyone wants to know, hey, should I buy here? Or is the market going to go lower? Is the market going to go up? Is it going to go sideways? And the reality is, I have no idea. You don't have an idea. No one has any idea. But it's surprisingly not that important when you buy. What matters way more is how long you're able to hold. So over a 10-year period, stocks have gone up about 90% of the time. If you go 20 years, they've gone up 100% of the time, and over 30 years, also 100% of the time. So the point at which you buy here, let's say you, you bought here and then stocks ended up going you know, another 10 or 20% lower, yeah, your future returns aren't going to be as high as they would have been if you'd have timed it perfectly, but the problem is you're never going to time it perfectly. None of us are. I think the most important thing you can do is, again, focus on increasing your savings, focus on consistently adding money each and every month to a strategy that you believe in, and over time, these inevitable dips and flows, you're going to put money each month into them, and ultimately, I think the market's going to move higher over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And it won't really have mattered whether you bought in when the S&P was at 4,000 or 3,600 uh, if you just kept in, you know, investing this entire time. The length of time you're going to hold matters a lot more than when you buy. And the ninth and final principle is that 20% of the joy in your life is going to come from money. 80% is going to come from other parts of life. As cheesy as this may sound, I think you're going to find that it's true. When I was a teenager, I was obsessed with investing. When I first got married, I was obsessed with saving every last penny. My wife would tell you that we were hardcore cheapskates. I did not want to spend money on anything. I've got some funny stories that I won't share publicly on the internet about that. But as I've gotten older, and I'm not that old, I'm, I'm 33, but I've come to appreciate that there's a lot more joy to be had from life that has nothing to do with money. And ultimately, your investment portfolio should be used to serve you or serve other people. So I would encourage you to sit down and think about what is the point of your investment portfolio? Why are you investing? And if it's just to create some massive hoard of money, I think you're going to find that that ultimately is an empty, very empty place to be. Uh, your investments should be having some kind of a purpose that's bigger than just having bigger numbers on the screen. I've met a lot of people where that's the reality of their situation, and they are some of the most miserable people, uh, I think, on planet Earth. People find that, okay, they now have all this money and whatever the world has to offer, and they still find that it's ultimately not enough. So I would encourage you, seek after the higher things in life. Uh, the things that are going to last uh, eternally, um, and the things that matter most here on earth. Those things are relationships and giving to others and doing things to serve your fellow man. So focus on those things first and foremost, and your investment portfolio uh, will ultimately uh, not carry with you after you die. So as always, thank you for watching. I appreciate all of your support. Leave me a comment in the comment section if you can think of anything else that the Pareto Principle applies to, and I will see you in the next video.